Hey, it's Lisa Wimberger here. I'm the founder of Neurosculpting and I have helped thousands of people learn really powerful tools to regulate their minds and their bodies, including pro athletes, entrepreneurs, and those with serious stress-based illnesses. So I'm really excited to help you do the very same thing through education and some incredible guest experts. And together, we're going to discover the formula to unlock hope. So welcome. I am so excited for this episode with Dr. Avi Loeb. I'm going to read you just a tiny bit of his bio, knowing that there is so much more, um, but I cannot wait to get into this conversation. So uh, Dr. Avi Loeb is the, is the director of the Institute for Theory and Computation at Harvard, uh, working in astrophysics and cosmology. He's the founding director of the Black Hole Initiative a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the International Academy of Astronautics, and uh, according to Time, one of the 25 most influential people in space and a great dishwasher on Thanksgiving, cleaned <laughs> all the dishes for his family. That's impressive. Um, welcome. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's a great pleasure. And we could have saved time if you introduced me as a farm boy. And with respect to the dishes, I should clarify, uh, we made a deal with my wife when we got married that uh, I will take care of the dishes. And a, a day later, I bought a, a dishwasher and my wife said, well, that was not in the agreement. I said, well, <gasps> technology is allowed. You know, it's not. Uh... <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> I don't actually have a dishwasher. I, I've been washing dishes by hand for 25 years. Um, <laughs> So I would love to have that piece of technology, but you work with way more advanced technology. So I just want to set the stage for, for the people listening. Um, I got the pleasure of hearing you live at a recent event um, that we were both at. And what struck me about you was this amazing capacity to take complex science and put it in the framework of humanity and our move towards unifying humanity and so i went down this rabbit hole of all the things that i wanted to talk to you about and i was reading all of your not all of your blogs but a lot of your blogs and you had said this in one of your um blogs that really really anchors in this idea that i want to get across um, this idea of hope and you said the antidote to polarization is through the common physical reality, um, creating a universal narrative and that that's what science does is that um, science is the glue, scientific knowledge is the glue and that this fosters universal collaboration. And I feel like you were you were getting that message across when you talk about the we in relationship to extraterrestrial or interstellar um, uh, life. And I would love for you to talk a little bit about how is science gluing us back together and what is this polarization you're talking about? Right, so I think the real problem uh, that uh, leads to polarization is that people prefer to uh, beautify reality so that it satisfies their wishes in a way. Um, and one way to think of it is we put makeup on reality so that it looks more beautiful than it actually is. And in that way, we are happier. It's just like putting goggles on our head and living in the metaverse. You can always look like Brad Pitt over there and <laughs> be very happy and, and live next to celebrities, but it's not the reality that we all share. And the reason I think it's important to pay attention to the reality we share, I mean, you can take recreational drugs and escape from reality. The, the, the reason it's important is because uh, we have to adapt to it. You know, when the philosophers locked down Galileo and said, no, uh, we believe the earth is the center of the universe and not, we don't want anyone to hear your voice uh, even though he advised them to look through his telescope and uh, look at the Galilean moons of uh, Jupiter and uh, realize that perhaps the, the earth moves around the sun they refused to do that and um, of course it um, 
you know, satisfy their ego uh, and, and also their political um, agenda of uh, having more believers because the more you flatter humans, the more they adapt your doctrine. You know, you tell them that we are at the center of the world or you tell them that God is looking over our shoulder and cares about everything we do and they will believe you. If you were to say that the earth moves around the sun and the sun is one of ten, tens of billions of stars moving around the center of the Milky Way galaxy, which is one out of a trillion galaxies, so we're not really at the center of anything. And actually we're not that significant actors in the cosmic play because we came relatively late. Uh, then people will be sort of disappointed in a way because they are not important actors and uh, they may not uh, subscribe to your doctrine. And so the, the only issue is that by suppressing that notion, you don't change reality. Uh, the Earth continues to move around the sun. And if you wanted to reach Mars, you better realize that Mars doesn't move around the Earth because otherwise you would never get to your destination. So my point is, if you want to cure disease if you want to fight a virus by developing mrna vaccines you have to understand reality with all its pimples you know you have to look straight at its uh, at the way it is without beautifying it without putting makeup on it uh, that's our only hope for adapting to the reality that we all share and and in a way you know that's uh, there is a tendency of humans to avoid that now in politics it's obviously allowed because uh, you don't. You, you are under no obligation to subscribe to evidence in politics. You, the, the only reason you are elected is because there are lots of people who believe you, and you can fool people. But in science, you know, we have a duty to adhere to reality. I have a problem with some mainstream scientists that talk for half a century about things that we cannot observe, like extra dimensions, string theory. I have a problem with that because we are getting into the realm of you know, uh, doctrines that were never tested. And uh, the way I see science is as a dialogue with nature, where we listen to nature and we hear back the answer by doing experiments. And sometimes nature surprises us and we cannot fully understand it. And, you know, Albert Einstein couldn't understand quantum mechanics, but that's his problem because quantum <laughs> mechanics is used to make gadgets and the Nobel Prize in physics this year was given to three experimentalists that proved Einstein wrong. And I, Einstein was wrong three times in a single decade at the end of his career when he was supposed to be the most knowledgeable about nature. So the point is very often we have the wrong ideas and nature is educating us and we have to be humble. The, the, my main message is we have to be humble. And the way I see myself is as a common person. I don't you know, I'm uh, trying to think, uh, to basically express ideas that I fully understand and not pretend that I know more than I actually know. It's not about my, me, it's about, you know, the reality that we share and I want to describe it to the best of my ability. And that's because I was born in a farm and I, you know, I feel like I'm not part of the elite. I was somehow elevated to be the chair of the astronomy department at Harvard for almost a decade, the longest serving chair. And, that's a privilege, uh, but I never felt as if uh, I resemble many of my colleagues because a lot of academ academic work is about um, showing off. You know, it's about mm. showing that you are smart. And I don't feel that this is the duty of scientists. I feel that we are supposed to understand reality. And sometimes, you know, we don't need to do mathematical gymnastics. You know, if if there is, for example, evidence for another civilization which is smarter than us in the form of some gadgets that we find around us then it doesn't require you know showing off in in sort of uh, mathematics of extra dimensions it's, it's just a matter of looking up and and seeing those gadgets you know like this is not very sophisticated so my point is we better uh, look at reality and try to figure it out and you know i think this is the most sincere uh, form of love if mm. you want to love a partner you don't want the I, the first thing i said to my wife on the first date was don't put makeup i don't need this um and you want to know the partner with uh, all of it of, of the partner's you know um qualities and um even if it doesn't look as if it's the the best way that the partner may look like you just want to know it and and the same about reality you know there are many possibilities where reality could have been better and we would have been happier 
but uh, that doesn't mean that we need to uh, imagine reality as being better. We, we just need to figure out what it is and then adapt to it. And I think that is the only path forward because uh, in that way, we will survive. You know, it's Darwinian survival, you know, survival of the fittest that you have. Uh, one of the definitions of being the fittest is realizing what reality is and adapting to it. So um, I, when I hear you talk about this and I hear you put humans in the perspective that we're actually not the main actors and, and we're kind of insignificant at some point when you look at the, you know, the, the vastness of, of all of the other blue planets out there. Um, how does this play into your day-to-day -day life? So when I think of this, I think, well, that kind of takes the pressure off me to have to be perfect or to have to be right. And at the same time, that's an ego trip where I have to say, oh, well, do I, how do I matter? And if I don't matter in the big scheme of things, then how does that drive my behavior? So I'm curious how this, how this lens shows up inside your home life with your family and d does your family subscribe to this same sentiment? Yeah, so the way I um, approach it is, um, you know, if, if someone tells me I'm in a class where there is a smarter student, uh, most people would be depressed. They would say, no, I'm actually, I don't want to know about this student. I better pretend that I'm the smartest. But the way I approach it is I want to learn from this student. I want to figure out how to improve uh, my perspective. And, um, you know, that, uh, so if, if the same conditions that we find on Earth are likely to exist on billions of other rocks in the Milky Way galaxy, and then there are you know, a trillion other galaxies like it in the observable volume of the universe, I say, let's try and learn from others because we came at the end and we may not be the smartest uh, in our class of intelligent civilizations. Whereas other people say, well, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Let's pretend that we are the smartest until there is extraordinary evidence. And my point is that without extraordinary funding, we will never find those Mm. others it's like burying your head in the sand and saying i don't see anything and um, and that is a good approach if you want to promote your ego and mm. i think the ego is the source of all evil i think uh, for example putin vladimir putin if he realized that by conquering a small piece of land in ukraine he's he resembles just an ant which hugs the periphery of a single grain of sand mm. on the landscape of a huge beach, you know, maybe he will decide not to do it because <laughs> it's not really, I mean, for him, if he just reads, uh, you know, about Katerina the Great and all kinds, very locally, it sounds great. But if you think about the universe as a whole, it's really pathetic um, for a person to cause so much misery for that purpose. You know, we better work with each other rather than fight each other on the two-dimensional surface of this earth. And it's only by having a bigger perspective that we can realize that it makes no sense for us to fight each other. And I think if we find a smarter kid on, on the block, we would realize that the differences between us as humans are not so significant. So we should treat each other with respect uh, and, you know, w uh, and, and just work together to to have a better future i just don't understand why people would feel superior relative to each other uh, and as a result cause so much misery i mean you see it every day you see it throughout human history i think that is the one thing that makes us not so intelligent yeah it's proof right there um it's really interesting because i i feel and you you've implied this too in in some of your talks and your writings you know we've been so polarized especially in the last few years we were polarized religiously and politically and socially and and families are broken now and and all of this because we're claiming a side that we believe is right and that goes to your point of ego um and you also mentioned in, in your blogs, you know, we're all made of residue from the Big Bang and and um, 
the inside of stars. And what if we could view ourselves like that? Then we could be a we instead of an us and them. Right. And what do you differ between the us and them and then the idea of we? Right. Well, so one of the problems that causes uh, polarization is that you have people on the extremes and they make no sense on both sides. So they fuel each other. And there are very few people that try to follow common sense in the middle. And you see that in politics. I was surprised that it also appears in science because just in the context of searching for extraterrestrial civilizations. Okay, so we search for 70 years for radio signals, which is pretty much like waiting for a phone call. Hmm. And there is another approach, looking at your mailbox, whether any packages accumulated over time, that's a completely different approach. And yet you find that people that practiced for 70 years, the search for radio signals, completely dismiss any opportunity for looking for packages in the mailbox. They say, in fact, the SETI community, the traditional SETI community looking for radio signals, they said, we don't want any talk, any lecture in our conferences on the study of unidentified objects in space. Now, you think about it, given that approach, if astronomers are not searching, then who is most likely to find some unusual objects in the atmosphere? It's the government because the government as part of its day job has to search for you know ballistic missiles that pose a national security threat so every now and then they see objects that they don't understand and then the the director of national security uh of national intelligence uh avril haynes she um filed a report a year ago saying that there are objects the government doesn't understand which are not necessarily human made are not necessarily hmm. natural and you know and then bill nelson the head of nasa said that scientists should get engaged and figure them out and and the scientific community pretty much ridicules it so on the one hand you have the mainstream of science saying you know we don't care about what the government says this is ridiculous we we so they have a prejudice against looking into that even though radio signal sounds okay we can take check that to me, there is no difference between checking. In fact, it's much more likely to find objects because radio signals move at the speed of light. So if they were sent a billion years ago, they're now a billion light years away and you cannot see them. So mm. most civilizations could have perished by now and you wouldn't see the radio signals. Whereas if they sent spacecraft like we did, like we sent five interstellar spacecraft, they would pile up uh, in the Milky Way because they move slower than the escape speed from the Milky Way. So they keep, the Milky Way is like a basket, keeping them by its gravitational force, keeping all the objects, all the chemical rockets that were ever launched over the past 10 billion years. So it makes more sense to search for that. I call it archaeology, interstellar archaeology. Yeah, I was just thinking so, that. And, and how interesting that we're using that approach by sending out, but we're not honoring that we could recognize and get information that way from 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 interstellar objects. And that leads me to want you to talk a little bit about the Galileo project, because I believe that you're starting to collect data this week at the time of our recording this, correct? Yes, exactly right. Now, I just wanted to mention the other opposite extreme. So on the one hand, you have, just like in politics, you have the mainstream of science saying, we don't want to engage in that. And then you have those people who are believers, people that at age seven went to bed, and saw some lights in their bedroom, which convinced them that there are extraterrestrial visitors to Earth. And they are believers in the same sense that you have religious believers. You know, they just are convinced for no solid scientific reason that these things exist. So then the scientists look at those and say, we don't want to sleep in the same bed as those people. And therefore, mm -hmm. we won't even study those. So what I'm saying is that there are very few people that go into the middle ground and say, OK, let's collect evidence and see what we find, because the government talks about it. And that's what the Galileo project is trying to do, to do the same thing, that following common sense. And by the way, the taxpayers are very interested in the subject. Two thirds of the Americans believe in extraterrestrial life. That's more than the slightly less than 50 percent believe that God exists. So clearly wow. it's a subject that 
the taxpayers are willing to pay for. Nevertheless, there is no federal funding for it. NASA just started a study that will advise them whether to invest in this study. And I'm saying, okay, well, let's uh, get private donations. And in fact, a few multi-billionaires came to the porch of my home and gave me $4 million. And that established the foundation for the Galileo project. So in the Galileo project, we're simply trying to collect data on the sky because the sky is not classified. The government classifies data because it's using classified sensors. Uh, for national security purposes. Mm -hmm. So they cannot really reveal the data because the quality of the data would allow adversaries to figure out what the mm -hmm. government is using. So we say, okay, we, we buy off the shelf instrumentation, put them together and start looking at the sky. And in fact, this week, as you said, we are starting to collect data and then we will analyze it with artificial intelligence algorithms and try to figure out and uh, what the objects that we see are. And in general, you can expect natural objects like birds, insects, you know, um, um, thunderstorms uh, or meteors, uh, or you might imagine human-made objects like drones, weather balloons, satellites, airplanes. Uh, but then there could be something else. And that's the question. And it may well be a mixed bag. Most of the time, it will be an object belonging to one of these two categories. But it's sufficient to have one object that is extraterrestrial in origin for this to change the future of humanity because it will be some form of an op a functional device that uh, represents technologies that we don't possess. And, you know, that would give us, um, that would inspire us to uh, go in the same direction. It's sort of like seeing a smarter kid in our mm. class. And um, I think altogether, it's one way out of, um the traditional waste of energy and time that we are engaged in throughout human history where you know we think of it as a zero-sum game where if we want to get something someone else has to lose that's not mm -hmm. true in science you can have an infinite sum game where everyone can win and if we gain knowledge about more advanced technologies everyone will win from it and you believe is it a Muamua, the the asteroid that landed right in the ocean? So you're not just planning on looking at data from the sky. You're you're planning on looking at data from the bottom of the ocean. Is that right? Right. So only over the past decade, we found interstellar objects, objects that came out from outside the solar system, because pr prior to that, we didn't have the instruments allowing us to see them. And mm. um, actually, the first such object was found in 2014 uh, by the US government sensors and it was a meteor an object roughly the size uh, half the height of a person uh, which uh, collided with earth it was a meteor it burned up uh, about 19 kilometers above the ocean surface mm. um, 100 miles off the coast of Papua New Guinea and it was moving so fast that we concluded with my student uh, Amir Siraj that actually it came from outside the solar system and the US government uh, this year confirmed our conclusion, basically mm. said that the 99.999% um, indeed this object came from outside the solar system. That that uh, memo came from the uh, Department of Defense, the U.S. Space Command. Is that the first time that's ever been recognized that an object has come from outside of our solar system? Yeah, that was the first one. Wow. And we discovered it. And then there was another one that we found uh, in March 2017, another meteor. And what was unusual about them based on the government data is that both of them uh, were tougher than iron because they only disintegrated in the lower atmosphere of the earth where the stress mm -hmm. is extremely large and they were moving really fast. So um, uh, they were tougher than all 270 other space rocks in the catalog that the government compiled and that made them uh, uh, unlikely to be drawn from the same population of objects of space mm. rocks uh, uh, less likely as than one part in ten thousand because we have two objects and so it means that even if they are natural in origin the source of these meteors must be different than the solar system it must be something completely different so we can learn about it and of course there is a possibility that they were made of some alloy that was artificially produced stainless steel for example and the only way to find out is to go to papua new guinea which is what we are planning to do with a boat 
and scoop the ocean floor for the meteor fragments, the, fra the pieces that were left behind from the explosion, from the fireball, and figure out their composition. And uh, I received the one and a half million dollars to do that um, from a private donation. So we're planning to do that in spring uh, 2023. So what and kind of information can you get from that? What's that? What do you hope that tells you? Well, we would like, first of all, to figure out if it was artificial mm. uh, or natural, this object, whether it was some kind of uh, alloy that nature doesn't make, doesn't put together, you know, that uh, that we use, for example, when we build the spacecraft. Because if you think about New Horizons, that's one of the most recent spacecraft that we launched to study Pluto. Uh, and it will escape from the solar system into interstellar space. And in a billion years, it could collide with another planet and look like a meteor. And mm. uh, for an astronomer over there to figure out that it's artificial, they would just need to you know, collect the fragments and see that it was made of stainless steel. I mean, that, that is easy to tell. Um, so that's the plan. And um, I also promised the curator of the Museum of Modern Art that if we find a gadget, I'll bring it for display because for us, it will represent modernity. Uh, and for them, of course, it's ancient history for whoever sent it because it may have taken a billion years for this gadget to reach us. So that's, I should say, these are the two interstellar meteors that we discovered, but there was a third object called Oumuamua that was discovered, never didn't collide with the earth and was a hundred times bigger than these two meteors, uh, the size of a football field. Oh, wow. And it was found by reflecting sunlight. And it looked really unusual. Astronomers first said, well, maybe it's a rock, a big rock, a hundred, you know, the size of a football field. But uh, it turns out that it had a very extreme shape, most likely flat based on mm. the reflection of sunlight as it was tumbling. And then, um, it was pushed away from the sun by some mysterious force without evaporating at all. And then um, I suggested that it's pushed by sunlight and therefore it's very thin. And in fact, uh, three years later, there was another object discovered with the same qualities, turned out to be a rocket booster that NASA launched uh, back in 1966. So uh, here is a proof that an artificial object that is very thin uh, uh, looks just like Oumuamua. And, um, the question is, who produced this object? Um, mm. So altogether, you know, the fact that the first three interstellar objects look weird, they didn't look like space rocks of the type that are familiar to us from the solar system, to me is an indication that we may be missing something about our cosmic neighborhood. And I love the idea, and I think you said this um, at the event that we were at, that it, it cost billions to go out into space to find this proof, but it only cost a few million dollars, which is very easy for multi-billionaires to, to just donate to you. For you to actually go extract potential evidence that this is either um, outside of our solar system alloy artificially made or of some origin that sheds yet more light on the question of are, are we alone? And so when you talk about extraterrestrial life, I think people think little green men. What do you think when you what do you mean when you say extraterrestrial life? Are you are you meaning bacteria or single cell organisms? Or do you mean civilizations that make crafts and with alloy materials. Right. Well, first I should uh, say that uh, when I think about the superior intelligence, I usually think of women, not about men. Oh, that is a <laughs> great answer. But, uh, because, you know, throughout my life, you know, I, I had a very strong connection to my mother and I was surrounded by women. I have two sisters, two daughters, my wife, and I really uh, feel that women are much more strategic and less um, uh, aggressive in their basic uh, approach to, to things in, in, in life. And mm. But anyway, um, what I do think about um, uh, an encounter is more to do with um, uh, a scientific or technological gadget than with uh, living creatures, because mm. uh, we were the 
you know, we were selected on the surface of this rock that we call Earth by uh, natural selection, by Darwinian evolution, to survive with an atmosphere under conditions that are quite comfortable. But once we venture into space, there are very energetic particles that bombard our bodies. We wouldn't survive very long. And also the journey is extremely long. It takes 50,000 years to reach the nearest star with chemical rockets. And that's roughly mm. the time that elapsed since the first humans left Africa. So mm. it's really complicated for humans to embark on long interstellar trips. And I can imagine the same to be true for other creatures on other planets. Okay, mm. so we are starting to get to the point where artificial intelligence will substitute humans. We already have that in search mm. engines on the internet, in perhaps self-driving cars. In, I think within the coming decade, the AI systems will replace humans in subscribing uh, drugs or medicine and uh, perhaps in some uh, elementary legal procedures. And so I can imagine using AI astronauts sending those mm -hmm. systems to space because they can be hardened to survive under the harsh conditions over there in vacuum. They don't need oxygen. And uh, also... You know that you can imagine uh, them uh, having the patience to go through long trips, and and the same must be true for other civilizations. They may have sent AI systems that uh, could adapt to changing circumstances through machine learning, but they are not biological creatures. So if I imagine an encounter, it will be with such systems. And if we want to understand those systems, you know, I would not rely on physicists. I would rely on psychologists because they're mm. used to dealing with uh, intelligence or even better with our own AI systems that will have some kinship to their AI systems more than to us. So the way I see it is, first of all, we need to find, you know, out, uh, outliers, those objects that do mm. not seem familiar, okay, that behave in ways that are not, that, that are not uh, common to familiar objects like natural objects or human-made objects. If we find any of those, trying to figure them out may be a long journey and it will likely involve um, psychologists or um, AI systems. Uh, but it's a step, you know, that's a second step. In the first step, we just need to see if there is anything unfamiliar out there. And what I'm saying is the first few interstellar objects looked as outliers. And that to me is a signal that we should uh, be intrigued and search for that. Whereas my colleagues try to brush it under the rug. Just to give you an example, uh, I have a colleague who is relatively young and who wrote a review paper about Oumuamua in a very prestigious journal called Annual Reviews of Astronomy and Astrophysics. And he, he wrote an email to me saying, I just finished the review on the comet Oumuamua. And I said to him, what do you mean the comet Oumuamua? It was not a comet. We didn't see any cometary tail. In fact, the Spitzer Space Telescope, you obviously know that, looked very deeply and couldn't see any carbon-based molecules around this object. It was definitely not a comet of the type that we are familiar with. And he said, yeah, but I have a theory that when we uh, looked at the object, it didn't have cometary evaporation, but when we didn't look at it, it had cometary, a cometary tail. And I thought to myself, I said, look, if you go to the zoo and you see an elephant, you know, what you're saying is similar to saying, this is a zebra, it just shows its stripes when you don't look at it. Now, when you think about it, <laughs> uh, that makes very little sense for a, mainstream, no sense a mainstream scientist to make this point and put it in a review paper, which is supposed to be an authoritative mm. summary of what we know about Oumuamua. And you ask yourself, why would he do that? The only <laughs> reason he would do that is to feel comfortable, to have this comfortable, cozy feeling that mm. this is a familiar object familiar. that conforms with our prejudice, that conforms with what our past knowledge would suggest. And that's what his colleagues uh, advocate for. So in order for him to get a job, he would much rather subscribe to this. And I say that's completely inappropriate for science. We should mm. be just like kids, you know, be, first of all, sincere when we don't 
see something familiar, we should admit it. We should not pretend that we can explain everything because you know it's a learning experience. And if we don't admit when new things show up, we will never never learn anything. We'll never see any anything new. And and that's really unfortunate because you know in the halls of academia we are supposed to be open minded, uh, and yet you find this behavior. And you know this was just a few months ago, just to show you how things are done, even within mm -hmm. science. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to fight that. Uh, and I get pushback, and it's really unfortunate. Um, so you you brought me back to this idea you said earlier of you know being humble. It takes a student mind. It takes curiosity to be humble because that means you're admitting you don't know. And when when I think about um, you know spiritual pursuits and 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 amazing texts like uh, the book, The Taboo of Not Knowing, you, you can't learn from a place of knowing. There's no, nowhere to go from a place of already knowing. So the right. only way to actually learn and evolve is to not know and then right. to, to have that curiosity. So how do you stay resilient when I imagine you're a little bit controversial for some of your colleagues? Well, uh, the way I think of it is, People say, I, I think outside the box. I just think the box is in the wrong place. I mean, mm -hmm. I, 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 I follow my common sense, okay? So the way I think of it is, let's just do the thing that sounds most reasonable, okay? And the fact that the box is somewhere else is the problem of the people who put the box somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I think eventually the box will come to my place. It's just like with <laughs> Galileo, you know? Galileo just did what sounded like common sense to him. And then people argued that, that is very controversial and put him in house arrest but it's just because other people put the box in the wrong place okay I, so I so i think we should be guided by evidence and one thing i wanted to to say is that spirituality and the frontiers of science have a common thread which mm -hmm. is uh studying exploring the unknown mm -hmm. you know th there is so much we don't know knowledge is just an island in an ocean of ignorance and unless we admit it you know, we will stay stuck to this ignorance. And uh, so the only way to expand the landmass of the island of knowledge is to, to, to indeed admit that we are students, you know, that we are just trying to learn and willing to make mistakes. You know, that's part of the learning experience. You can't always pretend that you know, uh, because sometimes, you know, we have the wrong ideas. So, uh, you know, what I find instead is that, many you know like for 50 years there are people in the mainstream of theoretical physics who work on ideas that were never tested and that in fact whenever they were tested they didn't prove uh, to be right you know like for example the idea of supersymmetry you know that uh, when i started practicing science it was the most popular idea about uh, a new symmetry of nature and there is a natural a range of parameters that will be in principle detected with a large hadron collider and we invested 10 billion dollars we didn't find it okay so i don't say it's a waste of money but i say you wish that should teach us uh, some modesty because obviously you know the mainstream was wrong in that in that context and not only that but then for 50 years there are people talking about extra dimensions and you know, they are part of the mainstream of theoretical physics and they take it for granted, even though there is no evidence for it. And uh, I say, well, you can spend your life worrying about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. OK, and you can have a large community of people discussing it and it could be in extra dimensions. You can prove to each other that you are really smart, you know, but we wouldn't it wouldn't necessarily describe reality. Mm. OK, and and so. It's really a question of whether we are trying to impress each other or we're trying to figure out reality. And I think uh, for the benefit of society, we better figure out reality and we better stay modest because the source of all evil throughout human history is this uh, pretension to know more than we actually know. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I wondered, especially after hearing you, I wondered what could change about the way we perceive each other if let's say evidence arises from your explore from your collection of data that says 
this is a piece of technology. This is an artifact from a, a civilization that is long gone, that was as advanced, if not more advanced. This is their AI. We're getting to look at it. We are not alone. We never were. And um, I, I often wonder what will that do to our petty divides, these 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 polarizations we have, which now our AI, our social media is designed to inflame the the right. divide. And, and I just, I felt so much hope after listening to your talk that I thought, I, I start looking differently at my place in the universe. And it's significance and it's insignificance. It's significant because I'm now recognizing its insignificance. And, and um, so, so I know we're, uh, you know, getting close to time, but um, I want to ask you, what do you think, I want you to describe what you think you may feel when you collect your first pieces in the right. spring, and you're actually holding them and looking at them? What's that going to be like for you? Right. So, um, you know, I should uh, admit that um, I have no footprint on social media. So I just want to figure it out. Okay. And if other people catch up with it or not, I don't really care. If other people live in their bubbles and refuse to accept it, I don't really care. I just want to know if there is someone smart out there in interstellar space. Okay. That's all I want to know. And of course, if that's the reality, if I find the evidence, whether others accept it or dismiss it or ignore it is completely irrelevant. You know, there are lots of people that ignore facts. Um, sometimes they become uh, political leaders, uh, but that's completely irrelevant because uh, whatever they believe in does not describe reality and therefore it will go away eventually. And mm -hmm. um, so that's what I want to figure out. Now, it, obviously, if it's the truth, it will have huge implications because it means that one way or another eventually it will become evident to everyone and uh, i think it will be the biggest discovery of humanity because you know i have uh, two daughters that uh, when they were young they thought that they are the center of the world because they compare themselves to family members and obviously they had a psychological shock on the first day to the kindergarten <laughs> because they realized there is a smarter kid in the block and and that will be the same realization. And for me, you know, it was, it will be um, I, I, both humbling, but also empowering because it will provide a path perhaps to our salvation instead of mm. uh, fighting each other, instead of focusing on the relatively sort of depressing thoughts that we usually have about politics and what separates us, suddenly we'll realize that you know, we are not alone. We are not just on this planet. There are many you know, billions of other planets. And in fact, our future may be in space. We need to produce more copies of what we find precious here on Earth so that it doesn't uh, risk the um, existential um, danger of being um, eliminated by some catastrophe. And, you know, it's just like... Um, uh, before the printing press uh, by, uh, was invented by the uh, Gutenberg, um, before that, uh, the Bible was handwritten and mm. any copy was extremely precious. But once uh, the printing press came about, uh, then then uh, many more copies were available. And, it, you know, there wasn't that worry of losing the content of the Bible. And the same is true about life on Earth and everything we find precious. If we produce copies of it and send them into space, that would make us more relaxed about what may happen on Earth. And just to remind you, you know, we are talking about global warming. That's becoming a very major item about how we change the climate. But in a bigger context, you know, we pretty much rely on the sun for warming us up. And within a billion years, the sun will warm us too much. It will basically mm -hmm. boil off the oceans because of the evolution of the sun as a star. You know, there is no way out of that. So even if we manage our affairs very carefully, uh, that would not avoid the calamity that awaits us when the sun will basically destroy uh, the prospects for life as we know it on Earth within a billion years, which is 20% or so, just a fifth of 
the age of the earth. Okay, so we just have 20% left, irrespective of what we do politically, uh, and we will need to go to space somewhere else. And mm. um, if you just think about it, other stars, it turns out that most of the stars like the sun formed the uh, five billion years before the sun so they went through that already mm. we just didn't hear the cries of those civilizations that uh, basically were eliminated as a result of their star evolving uh, they probably sent a lot of radio signals but uh, there were only microbes on earth at the time and we didn't hear those cries for help and probably most of the spacecraft there was a huge exodus from those stars where Lots of spacecrafts were launched by their NASA, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, organizations, and people try to escape before the star eliminates uh, the habitable condition on their planet. And so, most of the mo most of the spacecraft in in interstellar space may have originated from this last phase before the star extinguished life on habitable planets. But the point is, many other planets went through that already, and we, it, this awaits us in our future. And just getting that perspective, just realizing mm. the bigger context, you know, I think will change the way we think about our life. And in principle, it could also give us some meaning to our life. Mm. Uh, uh, because, you know, throughout human history, there is a lot of reference to God uh, in theology, in philosophy, in religions, and so forth. But a very advanced scientific civilization would be an approximation to God, you know, because mm. they may be able to produce life in their laboratories, perhaps even produce baby universes, who knows? But it would look like magic, and and um, it may unify religious, philosophical, theological ideas with science you know very often we think science and religion are in conflict but here is a way of bringing them together if we find a very advanced scientific civilization it may be just like god for us i'm hoping for that because i feel like that kind of perspective shift on humanity is miraculous that's what i'm i would feel like that was miraculous um i I have a million questions, but um, I'm going to I'm going to consolidate what I'm taking from this conversation so that our listeners maybe can take some of this with them. Um, I'm taking some of these these sentiments that one science is dialogue between um, nature and itself Two, be humble. And the way to do that is to stay curious. Um, I loved what you said that the sincerest form of love is reality that i think that's my new my new mantra um you said ego is the source of all evil uh you said that we have an infinite sum game not a zero sum game and that is very hopeful for me um and i also love that you said if we find this artifact this this interstellar thing that's potentially an alloy or something artificial or even an indication of just you know a, a, a rock we don't know about that we would be moving into modernity by discovering actually ancient history um and that uh you also said spirituality and science is the exploration of the unknown and all of these things to me um coming from you as scientist when I, when they hit me they hit me very spiritually and i love that that's now my consistent experience listening to you speak and that is my hope that that's what our listeners get from this is that um we're all big bang residue and interstellar stardust um avi thank you so much and um your last book was uh, extraterrestrial the first sign of intelligent life beyond earth and did you have one coming up or yeah i have a book coming up um, uh, called interstellar which would be uh, about the implications to humanity of finding evidence for some intelligent civilization out there the things that we talked about um and uh, there is also a documentary being uh, in the making and uh, a lot of exciting things in the coming year. So what I would say is what we discussed is not hypothetical. It's not a philosophical discussion. My hope is to make it real and just stay tuned. 
um, and follow my my blogs uh, because um, I will keep everyone up to date about what we find. Absolutely. It has been a pleasure, Avi. Thank you so much for spending some time with me. Oh, it's it's a great honor and privilege. As yeah. I said, uh, women represent the highest level of intelligence, as, as far as I can tell. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Unlock Hope. If you'd like to follow us on social media, we're at Neurosculpting Institute on Facebook, at Neurosculpting on Instagram. You can always reach out to us on our website, neurosculpting.com, and you can download our app, Neuropraxis. Stay well, everybody.